it was be strong that's the title of the sermon tonight be strong and as i read through this chapter i was thinking about what would be a good title for this chapter and what i realized is the way paul ends this chapter the way paul ends first corinthians 16 is literally strengthening the church is finding ways hey this is how we can strengthen one another let's pick it up on verse number one first corinthians 16 verse one it says now concerning the collection for the saints as i have given order to the churches of galatia even so do ye my first point for tonight is strengthen the needy strengthen the needy so what we see here well let's read verse number two he says upon the first day of the week let every one of you every one of you lay by him in store as god hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when i come now what we gather here is that there is a collection for the saints okay paul is traveling through and he says look that there are saints that need your assistance he says there in verse number one i gave the same instruction i gave the same order to the churches of galatia to put a collection for the saints now i'll just quickly read to you from romans 15 you don't need to turn there but it gives us a little bit more information about this romans 15 verse 24 he says whensoever i take my journey into spain i will come to you for i trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you if first i be somewhat filled with your company but now i go into jerusalem to minister unto the saints so there was a problem there was a necessity in jerusalem for the saints in jerusalem and as he was passing through as he was writing letters to these churches not just to the galatians but to the romans and to the corinthians he says look we need to go and, and i need to go to jerusalem and and minister to the saints they have a need okay now i'm not sure exactly historically what that need was i have heard that there was drought i've heard like th these are extra biblical sources that say at this point of time there was a drought in jerusalem and there was a shortage of food and so you know th the saints got together and put a collection to help one another right now that could be right i'm not sure uh, but we don't really know but what we see here is that even though the corinthian church was a church with a lot of problems there was still a church that could help saints in need there was still a church that could strengthen the saints saints in need and at this point they needed finances they needed help monetary aid to help them get through their difficulties and let me say to you that if we have brethren that are in a financial need that are struggling for whatever reasons and the, and the request comes to us hey is there something you can do to help then i would probably apply a similar principle here i would probably say to you hey you know this coming sunday you know pray about it dig deep you know such and such brethren need our assistance we're going to have a special collection this Sunday for that, for that situation, okay? I mean, uh, it's, never it's never had to happen, right? I'm, I'm saying besides your usual tithes and offering, if you can dig deep for this situation, then that might be something we do at some point in time if there's a financial need, okay? If there's a struggle for the saints, because we want to strengthen the needy, okay? And this is, this is the advantage of being in a church. This is the advantage of being in Christ, is that there are brethren throughout the whole world that you can get assistance from you know there are some places that have more than others you know there are third, third world countries that need you know to, a place to meet that they, they can't you know that they earn a lot less and a lot of times the we brethren from western countries help the brethren from poorer countries right or they help support a missionary in these these nations and again i would like to be a church that at some point we take on a missionary okay that we take on a missionary but we want to make sure that the missionary is doing the work we want to make sure that the missionary is not there just learning the language not just being not just studying not just you know raising a family but are actually actively going out preaching the gospel uh to the to the people in that area okay so there is a time where you know we, we can come together and have a collection for the needy strengthen the needy now there isn't a lot in the bible about how we give to the local church now i would just take this principle and by the way what's the first thing we learn here that on the first day of the week they were to come together and lay by him in store so this proves basically this proves that they were meeting on a regular basis on a sunday on the first day of the week because what did the seventh day adventists say oh you've got to you've got to you know you've got to um, have church on a saturday you've got to have it on the seventh day that's why i call the seventh day adventist and there are some that go as far as say well if you worship if you go to church on a sunday that's the mark of the beast yeah. it's crazy right 
But does that mean all these saints here in Corinthians were taking the mark of the beast because they were meeting on Sunday? But we see this was a regular occurrence. So we're saying, hey, on the first day of the meet, when, when, you, when you meet, that's the time to take collection. And so I just take these principles for our church. I know this isn't about your regular giving to the local church. I understand that. But I just take the principle that, hey, the first day of the week is, is the, probably the, is the best time to have the collection, to, ha- to collect the, 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 you know, the finances that come from your pockets to help finance the work of this church. Okay? That's why on a Thursday, I don't have the offering box out here. Okay? Because I, I don't, we don't need to. You bring it on the Sunday. Okay? Now, I'm just going to read to you uh, Malachi 3.10. Okay? Malachi 3.10 is, is a verse that's often quoted about tithing. You can turn there if you want. It's the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 3.10, it reads, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Okay? Now, just think about what we just read there in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. It says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. Okay? So there's a, there's, there's a time... It's basically it's talking about storage. A storage of the finances. Okay? And we see this in the Old Testament as well, that... The, the, the Old Testament temple was considered the storehouse. You can bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. That there be meat in mine house. What's the house of God in the New Testament? It's the church. In the Old Testament, it was the temple. In the New Testament, the house of God is called the church. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall be not enough room to receive it. Okay? So I'm just, I'm just bringing out of this the same teachings that we see sort of in the New Testament with the Old Testament, that there's a time to store up the finances, to bring in the tithes, okay? And I, I got asked the question, I think, um, because I, I, I need to do a whole sermon on tithing at some point, okay? I mean, there's so much to preach on. I feel like there's so many topics to preach on, okay? But I'm just going, I'm just going sermon as sermon as the Lord gives it upon my heart to preach, you know, to, to a newer church. And, and again, we, we don't have any troubles with the finances anyway, so it's not a topic that needs to be preached urgently, but I just want to make this clear that I do believe in the tithe. I do believe that we ought to give 10% of our income to the church. Now, I did cover this a few weeks ago, and what I said was I don't believe it's a mandatory requirement, okay? Now, the reason why I chose those words mandatory is because often when you hear people preach on tithing, they associate with this is mandatory, and the reason they say it's mandatory is because if you don't do it, God will curse you, okay? Now, the question that came to me, well, do you believe it then it's not a commandment? Well, no, no, I do believe it's a commandment, okay? And and, because you don't hear people, for example, let let me give you an example of this. Love thy neighbor. Is that a commandment? Absolutely, it's a commandment. But do you hear people say, is it mandatory? (laughs) Is this a mandatory requirement that you love? That's not the language people use, okay? But when it comes to tithe-in, people often use that that, uh, terminology, mandatory, in association with being cursed by God, okay? So what I just want to, and again, I'm not going to do a whole sermon on tithing right now. That's for another time, okay? And and there's a lot of of confusion over tithing as well as to what tithing is anyway. But uh, that needs to be done. So I just wanted to clarify that point just while we're here talking about finances, that I do believe you ought to give, it is a command to give 10% of your income to the house of God, that you ought to bring that to the house of God. But I do not believe it's a mandatory requirement in the sense that God will curse you if you don't do that because God, Jesus Christ, became the curse for us. And I've preached on blessings and cursings already in the past. If you need some information about that, you can let me know, okay? Um... And you know, at some point, what we see here in, in Malachi 3.10, it says, bring ye all the tithes. Okay, it's something we ought to bring to the storehouse. It's something we ought to bring to the church. That's why I've been very resistant just to open up a bank, a church bank account. Okay, because I know it will be very tempting to just deposit it automatically, right? I, I understand that. But there is something sacrificial about coming and bringing it into the storehouse on the first day of the week, Okay. And so, look, at some point, at some point, I will have, especially when we have the new church name, we will have a church bank account under that church name. And at that point, if you want to give into the church bank account, you can do so. But I didn't want to do that until I gave you my explanations as to why I believe that's the best practice, okay? That's what we kind of see in the Bible. And as long as we kind of live in a society that still has cash, I mean, I know we're almost cashless. You know, I would still like that same practice of bringing it into the storehouse and having that reserved for the local church. Okay. Now look at verse number 3, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 3. And when I come, 
Whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So your liberality, that's, that's reference to the collection. The collection that you come for the saints in Jerusalem, we we're going to send them uh, unto Jerusalem. But it says, um, Whomsoever ye shall prove by your letters. So back in those days, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have a telephone. Okay? So when they were sending uh, a representation from one church to another church, often they would go with a letter of recommendation. Okay? And some pastors and some churches still apply this today. Like if you want to change your membership from one church to another church, often the, the church that is accepting you re requires a letter of recommendation from, your sending, from the sending pastor. Because they, they want to make sure this guy is not like this crook that's been kicked out of the church, you know, that's been caught stealing or that's been you know, caught you know, extorting the brethren, has been, you know, whatever it is, and, and they're accepting that person. They want to make sure that the person they receive is in good standing. Okay? And that's why, you know, back in these days, without the internet, without phone calls, without Facebook, or whatever, right, they would take a letter to say, hey, we're from this church. Here's, you know, the, the, the approval from that sending church. And, uh, and look at uh, verse, number, verse number four. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. So saying, look, if I can, I will go with them to Jerusalem as well. Okay? But I think what's important here is that Paul maintains the independence of the Corinthian church. You need to collect the offerings and you need to send your people to go and give that offering to the other church in need. Okay? Paul is not saying, I'll come and take it. He's saying, you send your people by letter, by recommendation, to go and give it to that church. Okay? We see the independence of each church here as, as Paul speaks of this. Okay? And I think the other problem was, if you remember, there were some people that had a problem with Paul and they didn't want to pay Paul. Remember that? They didn't want to pay him. And so he's like, well, maybe, probably, that's why he doesn't want to take the finances with him in case, you know, there's accusations again of him being greedy for money or something like that, okay? Now, look at verse number... Oh, well, actually, before I say that, if we're going to give support as a church, okay, to another work, I want to make sure that that work is always under another church body. Okay? Now, I know there are good missionaries out there. I know there are good missionaries doing hard work, but they're not under the authority of a local church. They've not been sent out by a local church. They've gone and done it themselves. They've gone out to a nation, preaching the gospel. Thank God they're doing that. I'm not against the work that they're doing. Okay? But what we see here is the Corinthian church giving it to the church in Jerusalem, and then the church in Jerusalem would divvy up the funds as necessary. Okay? And that's why if you ask me, what about this missionary? What about that missionary? First of all, they need to be doing the work. But second of all, they need to be under a local church. Okay? Even if they're the best missionary I know, and they're doing the most work I know, I still believe the proper practice is that they are under the authority of a church and have been sent out by a church. Okay? So if you're wondering why those decisions, that's, that's why. Okay? Now, look at verse number 5. So we've seen how to strengthen the needy. We ought to strengthen our needy brethren, okay? But we also ought to strengthen a church by godly leadership. Strengthen a church by godly leadership. Look at verse number 5. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you. So he's saying, look, I might be there for the whole winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permits. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So his plans are to be, be in Ephesus, that's where he is at the moment, to be in Ephesus until Pentecost, and then he's going to look at traveling to uh, the Corinthians and passing through some other places. The point I want to bring out of this is, obviously we see this church struggling with good leadership, we see this church struggling in sin. We see this church just falling apart. But the way Paul sees that this church is going to be strengthened is with good leadership, with good preaching from good godly man. And he says, look, I'm going to make an effort to go and be there with you. I'm going to be there with you the whole winter. Let's say three months, something like that. that that's how long he's going to be with them and get things set in order. Not just the letter, the scriptures that he's written to them, but he wants to be there and preach to you guys, okay? So I, I would love to eventually have good godly men come stand behind this pulpit and encourage all of us, strengthen all of us, 
And I'm not saying that man necessarily has to agree with us on all doctrine. Right? So if he's got the foundations right, if he's a godly man, if he wants to see souls saved, if he's got the fundamentals right, and he's a godly man trying to serve the Lord, I would love to have men come and stand behind this pulpit that aren't from our local church and preach for us, strengthen us, encourage us as a church. Okay? But it's not just Paul. Look at verse number 9. Or well, actually, before we get to that, look at verse number 9 quickly. He says here, For a great door and effectual, and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. So that goes with verse number 8. But I will tarry at Eph Ephesus until Pentecost. So it says, look, I'm not in a rush to leave Ephesus. Why is he not in a rush? He goes, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. He's saying, there's a great door of ministry right now. He's having great success. The people in Ephesus are really receptive to the gospel. So that he explains that as this door that has been opened for him. So he's not in a rush to leave it, right? God has opened the door and he's ready to do the work there. Once he's done there, then he'll travel to uh, Corinth, okay? Now, you may have heard the saying, uh, let, me t let me see a raise of hand if you, if you heard this saying, but the saying goes, when God closes a door, he always opens a window. Who said that one? When God opens a door. All right, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> All right, it's not in the Bible. A lot of people think it is a biblical quote, but it, it kind of is a little bit. Okay? It kind of comes from this teaching here, All right? Because God does open doors, okay? And I would encourage you, if you're in a time, in, in a time and place where you need to make a decision, okay? Now, if you, mean, if you need to make a decision between right and wrong, it's easy. You, you choose what's right, okay? Th that's not something you need to ask God about. You know it's right or wrong, you choose what's right, okay? But sometimes in your life you need to make a decision and it could all be right. I mean, there's nothing wrong in of them, you know, you know in, in of itself. There might be multiple ways and that's where I would encourage you, Lord, open the door, make it clear, close the other doors and show me which way to walk. And look, sometimes God will just leave them all open and you just have to decide for yourself. But I like to go in prayer and often, often when I ask God this question, He answers it. Often He makes it so straightforward and so simple that I know, man, everything else is closed. This is the door to walk through. All right? Let me give you an example. You know, when I was wanting to come up here to the Sunshine Coast to start this church, I was working for a business that was importing goods from China um, and, and selling. And I was pretty much running the business all by myself, okay, for a friend of mine. And I had the opportunity to buy the business off him, okay? And I thought, it's not a big business, okay? Um, I just need a warehouse to put stock in there, and then it's all online, it's all through the internet. And I thought, you know what? This might be an opportunity for me to buy this business then take it up with, to, uh, with me to the Sunshine Coast. There was a big clientele. It was, it was making good money. And I could, you know, work in the church and also have this business where I could work my own hours and sort of work around. I thought it was a great opportunity. So, you know, I approached, you know, the owner and we agreed on a price. Then I went to the bank and asked for a loan. And every time I approached the bank, they always said, yep, you know, your house has equity. No problem. You'll be able to buy this business. But as soon as we sat down, how many kids, how many dependents? I don't know how many kids I had at that time, maybe eight. I was like, nah, <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. And I would go from bank to bank, from broker to broker, always, yep, it can be done. And then like, nah, can't be done, right? And, and I was frustrated, right? I was frustrated because I thought this was a door that I could walk through. And so I just prayed, Lord, you know, you need to close it or you need to, you need to open something else, right? And um, I remember telling the owner, he's saying, look, keep trying. I said to him, look, I've, I've lived a while now and I've experienced when something's so difficult, it's probably God saying, that's it. No, that's not going to happen, right? Do something else. And thankfully, within a few months, I was working for a granny flat company, right? And then I had the opportunity to build a granny flat on my property, you know, to build a house there, which is now being rented. And now that's my income, right? The income that I get from the house, the income that I get from the granny flat. That was something that opened up. I never planned to build a granny flat in my backyard. To, to think of that as, as an income source. But hey, you know, God opened up another door and I walked through that door. And so I would encourage you, hey, when you need to make decisions, ask God and He will. Uh, look, just coming up here to the Sunshine Coast, that's just one example. I can give you many examples where I was like, God, what, where, how? And Lord opened the door and He opened it and He made it clear. And it was, it was so clear that I'm like, I, someone asked me, are you sure you came to the right place? 
I say, without a doubt, I'm in the right place. Without a doubt, because I can see how God led me bit by bit. And most of you, I didn't even know when I thought about coming here, right? But we immediately have a church. I honestly thought it'd just be me and my family, you know? And maybe Cameron or something, I don't know. You know, but honestly, you know, I'm surprised by how many people were interested in this church and wanted this church to come. Obviously, if the people here were praying for that and God was making things happen, right? God was leading me in the right path and God was leading you guys in the right path. So just, just on that, you know, pray that God will open doors for you when you have many decisions to make. Verse number 10. Now, if Timotheus come... So not only is Paul going to come to this church to strengthen the church, he's sending Timotheus. That's another name for Timothy. You know, when we read the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, same guy, okay? It says, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Now if you just read that verse by itself, it sounds like he's saying, like, like he may or may not come. It says, Now if, right? Now if Timotheus come. But if you remember verse chapter number 4, if you want to turn there quickly, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul says to the Corinthian church, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So he had already sent Timotheus. But I guess, you know, back in those days, you know, the transportation, the difficulties of traveling, he's kind of saying, well, if, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm expecting him to be there. I already sent him. But we see that Paul sees the importance of sending godly leaders to a church to encourage them, right? Not just himself, but Timotheus also. Now look at verse number 11. Let no man therefore despise him. Why would people despise Timotheus? I was thinking about this, and my first thought is when we read chapter 1, they were worshipping men, right? They had men on a pedestal, right? They, 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 were, they, were, they were of Paul and they were of Apollos and they were of Cephas, but they weren't of Timothy. And I was thinking, well, maybe they see Timothy as this lesser leader and maybe that's why they despise him. But I was also reminded of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12, where Paul writes to Timothy and he says to him, Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So how is he encouraging Timothy? He says, don't let people despise you. Don't let it get to you that you're a young man. Okay? You're a godly young man. You know, be a good example. And he's saying the same thing to the Corinthian church. When he comes, don't despise him. So I'm assuming it like, must be about his youth then. right? It must be because he was a young man. And you know, sometimes... An older Christian can despise a younger Christian, right? The young Christian is doing more work for the Lord. He's doing greater things, right? Maybe he's preaching doctrine they don't even agree on, and they start to despise that younger, younger preacher. They start to despise that younger uh, believer. And he's saying to the Corinthian church, yes, he's young, but don't despise him, okay? He's someone that's going to come and strengthen and encourage your church. And for me, you know, if you've got a sermon... If you're over 12 years old, because how old was Jesus when he was telling, teaching, teaching doctrine at the temple? He was 12 years old. If you're 12 years old and over, and you've got a sermon for us, I'm willing to give you the chance. All right? Boys. <laughs> okay? If you're 12 years and over, you've got a sermon, a 10-minute sermon, I'm willing to get you up here and preach that sermon for us. Okay? I don't want anyone to despise your youth. Okay? God can use you at a young age. God can use you at an early age. Now, you may remember the Mother's Day sermon on Sunday. What did we learn about Timothy? His mother, his, his mother right? His mother, uh, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. Lois and Eunice, yeah, right. So, you know, I'm sure that, you know, his mothers, his mother and his grandmother, who encouraged him in the Lord, who's taught him the scriptures, you know, was now just rejoicing over the fact that Timothy is not just a pastor, but he's a traveling pastor. He's going from church to church and encouraging believers across the world, right? We see the impact of the mothers that they can have on, on, on a man. And we see that Timothy, even though he's young, he's used to help encourage this church. Look at verse 12. As touching our brother Apollos. Remember Apollos? I'm of Apollos. Yeah, now regarding Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. So he says, look, I'm coming, Timothy is already on his way, and Apollos will come when he's ready. 
we see the importance of sending godly men, especially to a church that's struggling, and to encourage them, okay? To encourage them, not to destroy them, but to encourage them, okay? Now, verse 13. Verse 13, the memory verse. Watch ye. What does it mean to watch? To be vigilant. Pay attention. You're already a church that's struggling. You're already a church that's falling apart. He says, watch. Don't be, don't be hurt anymore, okay? Pay attention. Stand up. He says, look, watch. Uh, stand fast in the faith. Now, he already taught them this in, ver- in chapter number 10, right? In chapter number 10, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So he's just encouraging them in the same things that he's taught him in the previous chapters. Saying, stand firm, watch, be vigilant. Don't let the devil, don't let the adversary come and hurt you any longer. Don't let these divisions in your church cause problems. And then he says, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. Okay? So if you may remember that, that was the teaching from chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 20, he said, Brethren, be not children in understanding, how being in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Stop being children that are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Stand firm, and stand firm. And as, as you saw in 1 Corinthians 16, sorry, in 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of good doctrine, right? Every chapter has some really great meaty stuff that this church needed. And Paul's just encouraging them, hey, everything I've just told you, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just concluding this letter. Remember these things. Watch, stand firm. Okay? Stand fast. Quit you like men. Stop being children. Stop being babes. Stop being immature. Grow up. Okay? And then he says, be strong. That's the title of the sermon, right? Be strong. And again, I'm reminded in the first chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So we want the wisdom, we want the wisdom that comes from God. It's stronger. Even the foolishness, what they consider foolishness in the world is still stronger than man's wisdom. He says, I want you to be strong. Strong in yourself, not strong in the Lord. Strong in His wisdom, strong in His understanding. Okay? Study this epistle. Preach this epistle. All right? He wants this for the Corinthian church. And then verse 14. And we've covered this recently. Let all your things be done with charity. What's charity? Love, right? Be loving to the brethren. Love one another. That comes from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. He said, follow after charity. Okay? Yes, watch, stand firm, stand fast, be strong, be men, but do it all with charity. Okay? Remember, if without the charity, it's all a waste of time. It's all unprofitable. Okay. So we saw, now we saw strengthen the needy. We saw strengthen a church with godly leaders, right? The Paul... Timothy and Apollos. Now, strengthen the work. Okay? Point number three is strengthen the work. Okay? Because this church was doing some work. And what Paul needs to tell this church is get behind the work. Get behind the workers. Okay? Do more than what you're doing before. Verse 15. I, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. What's the house of Stephanus? Who's Stephanus? You may remember his name from chapter 1. Right? Remember when Paul says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you? But then he says in verse 16, And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any others. But he says here in verse 15, he says that the house of Stephanus is the first fruits of Achaia. So here's what... Stephanus and his family are some of the first that got saved. Okay? They were early members of this church. Okay? And he says, he says look, I beseech you um, that this, this, this family, Stephanus, have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way of saying it. They're addicted to the ministry. Right? They love the work of God so much, Paul describes it as an addiction. Now, normally when we think of addiction... We think of it in negative terms, right? Addicted to drugs or addicted to alcohol or addicted to Facebook, right? I've heard that one a lot. Addicted to, you know, computers and internet and whatever. Often in a negative sense. But we can be addicted to good and godly work. 
Okay, Stephanus was one of those. He was addicted to the ministry of the saints. Now, I'm not sure if it means by ministry of the saints like, like um, uh, how, how do I explain this? Like a, a ministry to the saints? Like, like his ministering and serving the people in the church? I'm not sure if that's the reference. Or if he's saying the ministry, um, sorry, the ministry, what is that again? Ministry, what are the words there? Ministry. Sorry, guys, what verse am I up to? 15. Ministry of the saints like, the ministry of the saints. What's the ministry? The ministry of reconciliation. I'm not sure if he's saying that the ministry of the saints is the gospel preaching. And that's what they're addicted to. Or the ministry of the saints like, ministry to the saints, in that sense. Maybe both. Either way, this guy was a good example to this church. Okay? And what, what we'll see soon is that it seems like Stephanus may have been the pastor of this church, or if he wasn't the pastor, he just may have been a, a godly leader in this church. Because look at verse 16. He says, that yes, So in what way can we support, in what way can we, can we strengthen the work, in what way can we strengthen Stephanus? In verse 16 he says, That ye submit yourselves unto such. Unto such who? The household of Stephanus. And to everyone and everyone else, that helpeth with us and laboreth. So be there and help the laborers. You know, most churches that I've been to, 10% of the people do all the work. 10% of the people do all the work. Okay? When it's soul winning time, it's 10% of the people. It's 10% of the families. Okay? What Paul is saying, look, there are those that, look, he, he recognizes there are those that are going to do more work than others. But for those that aren't doing that, all that work, get behind them. Submit yourselves unto them. Help them out. Be part of the work. Strengthen them to do more. Okay? Because if you're doing all the work and you're not getting any support, eventually it's going to become discouraging. And so we ought to get behind the workers of the church. Right? If, even if you're not the one going soul winning, you know, ask, how is the soul winning? You know, can I pray for you? You know, is there anything more that I can do you know, to help you in that work, you know, and, and so, and it says, submit yourselves unto such, there in verse 16, it reminded me of Hebrews 13, 17, I'll just read it to you quickly, Hebrews 13, 17, that says, obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you, so that's what makes me think of, maybe Stephanus was a pastor, I, I don't know, because he's saying, hey, you know, submit yourselves to him, and to the work that he's doing. Because that's the same instruction he gave to a pastor, those that have the rule in the church, to submit under them, not to submit under, you know, to lord of the flock and, and, and be this big shot in the church, but submit in the sense, hey, you know, encourage the preacher, encourage the workers, and, and get involved in the work yourself. Look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortu Fortunatus and um, Archi Archiacus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. Now, I don't know who these other two names are. They're not really brought up anywhere else in the Bible. I tried to find it. But they could be, if you remember chapter 1, they could be of the house of Chloe. Now, if you remember, Paul says, look, I'm writing to you. I know there are problems in your church because the house of Chloe have confirmed these things. They've told me about these things. So it's possible these two other names are from the house of Chloe and they've gone to report to Paul about the struggles of the church. That's a possibility. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. It's not that important. But look at verse number 18. Verse 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. So kind of like you acknowledge Stephanus, he's doing the work, but not just him, but Fortunatus and Archaicus. Acknowledge them as well. Okay? Because it's possible if they were the ones from the house of Chloe, they're the ones that are reporting bad on the church. It's possible when they come back to the church, they won't be received very well. Are you told on us kind of thing, right? He says, no, get behind them, encourage them, right? Uh, and he says, look, Paul says in verse 18, uh, yeah, that they refreshed his spirit. You know, they were, they were a personal blessing to Paul when they came to see him as well. Now, the last point that I want to bring out of this chapter is strengthen brethren from other churches. Strengthen, strengthen brethren from other churches churches. Look at verse 19. He's wrapping up the chapter now. He says, the churches of Asia salute you. So he said, look, all the churches in Asia, they know about you and they send you greetings. 
Do you think that would encourage this church that's in strife? Absolutely. To know that there are other churches that love them and are sending them a message of greeting, right? That, hey, they know they're praying for us. They love us, right? Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Now, Aquila and Priscilla, we know, if you remember, in the book of Acts, they were with Paul and they helped get this church started. They were helping Paul laboring in the gospel. He says, look, they, they greet you. They're no longer there, part of that church. They've, they've moved to Ephesus. It says here, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So they had a church operating within their house in Ephesus. And that church salutes you. Okay? They send their greetings to you. All the brethren, verse 20, all the brethren greet you. Greet you one another with an holy kiss. All right? So it says, look, when you come, even like greet you one another. So in the church... When you, when you see one another, greet one another with a holy kiss. So starting from Sunday... <laughs> no, <nah>, I'm kidding. <laughs> in some places in the world, it's still common practice. You know, when we went to Chile for three months, they, you still greet one another with a kiss on the cheek. There's places around like... You know, and, and it took us a while to get used to that, right? Because I'm not used to just going to a lady and kind of giving her a kiss on the cheek. You know what I mean? But that's normal. It's not, it's not something inappropriate. That's just normal. It's, it's abnormal not to do it. Okay? It's abnormal. And so that was their tradition. That was their practice. They would greet one another with a kiss. So how would we apply that to Australia? It'd be like a handshake. Okay? That would be the holy kiss of, of Australians. A handshake, right? That would be appropriate. He says, greet one another. Okay? And, uh, you know, sometimes I kind of get frustrated because I'm trying to set things up for church you know, the, 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 the audio or whatever, my microphone, and I see people walk in, and I actually want to go there and greet you. I want to go and ha- sh- shake your hand or whatever, but I need to get this stuff done before the, you know, church starts or whatever. I, I feel frustrated because I know we ought to greet one another, and if sometimes you might say, well, Kevin didn't even say hi to me. Now, I, I don't know if anyone thinks that, but I have been in churches where people get frustrated and get angry at the pastor or get angry at other people in the church because they forgot to say hi to them or something like that. I don't want that to be like that. All right, that's my intention. My intention is to greet you with that holy handshake, okay, and, and to acknowledge your existence and acknowledge that you're a blessing to me just for being here in the church, right? And we see, hey, that's a good practice for a church. We see Paul instructing the Corinthian church, do that. You know, greet one another with the holy kiss. And uh, so that's, that's important, okay? It's important for someone to feel valued, to, to be greeted. You know, and if our church grows to the point, you, you, you know, I encourage you always greet new visitors, greet people you've not spoken to in a while, encourage them. You know, in the past there's been times where I just didn't want to go to church. I just felt down, I, I just didn't really want to be there, you know. But then when you get to church and there's been a time where a brother, oh, Kevin, great to see you, you're a blessing, you know, how's it going, is there anything I can pray for you? You know what? That's lifted my spirits. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I'm here, right? I'm glad that someone recognizes and acknowledges me and loves me enough to ask me about my life, you know? And so please be mindful. You know, you might not be the outgoing type. You might not be the person that that likes to um, encourage a, a believer, not because you don't want to, but maybe you're a bit shy in yourselves. Hey, but this is something you need to work on. This is something you need to work on. You know, be interested in the brethren. Greet them. Make them feel valued. It's so important. And you know how important, if, it, if you came into church and no one acknowledged you, no one said hi to you, wouldn't you feel a bit down afterwards? Yeah, I mean, this is something that's, that's easy to do and it's very important, okay? Very important to do. Now, uh, look at verse 21. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. So th- this part of the letter, Paul has written in his own hand. Now, you might say, What's, why is that important? Well, there was a, back then, there were people trying to um, pretend to be Paul. They would write letters and pretend to be Paul and obviously teach false doctrine. So he's saying, look, this part of the letter, I guess it had a different handwriting or something, is from Paul. Okay? And I'll just read to you quickly. You don't need to turn there. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. He says, at the end of it, he says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. So when you see my writing, this final bit, okay, then you know, yeah, this definitely came from Paul. Otherwise, if it's the same handwriting and he doesn't acknowledge his little token, whatever that is, maybe a signature, I don't know, you know, then don't reject that. That's not, that's not a teacher from Paul. That's just someone pretending. <coughs> that's someone's pretending to be Paul, not to take notice of that. Verse number 22. 
We almost done here. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. You know what's that? Why is that not in English? Well, anathema means accursed. If someone in because this church had problems, right? If there's someone in your church that does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, they're speaking bad of him. In fact, I think we read about that there was some talking about Christ being cursed, things of that nature. If there's people like that, then let them be accursed. Okay? Don't accept them in fellowship. Don't, don't be friends with them. This is another sin that will get you kicked out of church. I won't, I won't preach on this one, though, as a separate topic. But if someone's there in the church causing problems, saying that, that and, and hating Jesus Christ, then have nothing to do with them. Let them be accursed. Okay? But then it says, Maranatha, and what that means is, our Lord come. Okay? So it's like, just final words. You know, if someone hates the Lord in your church, just, they're a curse. Get, get rid of them, okay? And, hey, be excited for the Lord's coming as well. Be excited for His return. Our Lord come. And you might say, well, why is that written like this? Why isn't it written in English? It was, the reason why, and if you're curious, it's not that important, but if you're curious, it's because it was a transliteration of Aramaic into Greek and not a translation of the, the Aramaic words into Greek words. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give you an example. In our English um, language, in our, in, our, in our, you know, there are words, most of the words we speak are English words. But you know, we also commonly use words that are not English words. So I just checked this with Christina again before we came here. There are no English words that end with the letter I. Are there any exceptions? Maybe except for I. Like I. <laughs> but there's no, English words do not end with I. What about spaghetti? Spaghetti ends with I, doesn't, doesn't it? It does. So obviously spaghetti comes from Italy. It's an Italian word. But what do you call spaghetti in Italy? What do you call spaghetti in Italian? Anyone know? Spaghetti. It's spaghetti. Okay? So my point is this. That word spaghetti in Italian was not translated into English. We don't have an English word for spaghetti. We have a transliteration of the word, which we've basically just taken the same word and applied that to English. Okay. So when the King James translators translated these words, they kept the way it is with the Aramaic way of saying it um, because it's a transliteration and not a translation. Why is that important? Just for your information, okay, if you're curious to know. The word menu, the word menu is a French word. It's not an English word. But we still use it because we use it as a transliteration, okay, not as a translation. All right, uh, uh, 23, verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, I don't really have any thoughts on those few verses there, but you can see just Paul wrapping it up. It's, I think it's a great epistle. I think it's a great book to go through as a, as a new church, especially a church that may be struggling with difficulties. Uh, the, one of the best books you can read through, okay? But I just want you to think, just honestly, yourselves, just think of this church, okay? Pretend we have the Corinthian church an hour away from us, okay? Like, the way they were, we know, that, like, literally there's a Corinthian church like that right now, okay? Now, chapter 1 was these people were lifting up men in the position of Jesus Christ. They were causing divisions over their favorite preachers. Okay? Chapter 2, well, chapter 2 is not a problem. That just a teaching of, of the Spirit of God that teaches us spiritual things. Chapter 3 was about Jesus Christ being the foundation that we need to lay our rewards on Jesus Christ. But then chapter 4 was that they were proud and foolish. They made foolish judgment on believers that were despised by the world. If you remember that, Paul says, hey, we're despised, but you're, you're like, you're rich, if you remember that. Like, he's being sarcastic toward them, okay? Because there were people in that church that were proud, and they were looking down, they were looking down at believers that were working hard for the Lord, but were being despised by the world. Think about if this church existed right now. We have proud, boastful Christians there looking down on people being persecuted, okay? Verse chapter number five is about they were accommodating grievous sin, Grievous sin, they were accommodating that in the church and they weren't kicking people out over these sins. Okay? Uh, chapter number six, they were taking brethren to court over trivial matters. Chapter eight, they were, 
It was about the liberty in Christ. That they were using their liberty in Christ and not being mindful of how they were offending their fellow brethren. Okay? They weren't doing wrong, but they weren't being mindful of the brethren that were weaker or younger brethren. And so they were taking their liberty and causing brethren to sin. Chapter 9, they were resistant toward the apostleship of Paul. They didn't want to pay him, if you remember that. They didn't want to pay him. Um, chapter 11, he had to teach them about the length of hair. What the right length of hair is for a man and what the length of hair is on a woman. I mean, he had to teach them some very basic things there. And, and how they were to administer the Lord's Supper. Okay, Because there were people in the church greedily eating and drinking, not leaving it for anybody else. They, they weren't mindful about their fellow brethren. Chapter 13, they were lacking love. They were lacking charity and love for one another. Chapter 14, they were disorganized and unorganized and disorderly. He had to teach them how to be organized and how to have how many preachers and, and how to use you know, the unknown tongues in the church and things like that. You know, in chapter 15, there was some saying there was no resurrection. There was no resurrection. I mean, think about this. If we had an IFB church right now that was just like this church, don't tell me you wouldn't throw them out. Like, don't tell them, don't tell me that you would be like, oh, I'll just be accepting of them because they're my brethren. You know full well, and I, even I would. If you said to me, Kevin, I'm thinking of going to that church, I'd be like, don't go there, man. That's a disaster. They're going to tear you down. They're going to destroy you. I, I would not look lightly, I would not look well on that church, okay? But what's Paul doing? Paul gets in there, encourages them, right? He says, I love you. I'm going to send leaders to help get you right. Okay, I'm going to teach you doctrine. We're going to get you back. And look, I would think, I would have thought this church had lost their candlestick. I would have thought by now God would have nothing to do with that church is no longer truly, no longer represents the body of Christ whatsoever. That's what I would think. And I think, if you're honest, you would think the same. My point is this. Let's not be so harsh on churches that are failing. Okay, churches that have maybe doctrine that we strongly disagree on, if they're not fundamentals, okay, let's not be so harsh on these people. They need to be encouraged. Okay, we need to give them at least the opportunity where maybe we can be a blessing to them. Maybe we can encourage them. Maybe there's a church that's not doing any soul winning, but they're true believers of Christ. Hey, there's an opportunity for us to get in there and say, hey, Brethren, can we help you? Can we get out there, knock doors on your behalf, preach the gospel? We'll use your tracks. It doesn't matter. We get the rewards in heaven. It doesn't matter what church or what tracks we're using. We'll use your tracks. We'll, we'll, we'll um, encourage your brethren. If you want us to take them and take them soul winning and train them, that's what we need to be, right? And, and not be so aggressive. Look, they had problems. Paul had to fix it, Okay. But let's not throw out every church that doesn't line up perfectly with the way we would like it. Okay? Because that's you lacking charity. These people need to be loved. These people need to be encouraged. These people need to be prayed for. Even, hey, just a greeting from our church. Hey, man, we're praying for you, brethren. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're serving the Lord. Let's make sure we're balanced in all these things, okay? Because I'm not having a go at you because I would be the same. I would look at that church and go, man, God's done with them. God was done with them a long time ago, but that's not true. God was still able to come in and help encourage them. And when we go through 2 Corinthians, we'll see that this church turned the corner. We'll see that this church got right with the Lord and became a true church of God that people looked up to. They got themselves right. Okay, let's pray.